Welcome to the show. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, the name of the show is The State of the State of Hawaii. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Today, we're going to visit with an expert who leads an essential state function of great benefit to the public. I think it's unlikely that many are unfamiliar with the role of education in our lives, our children's lives and how important these agencies and the work of them are to us personally and professionally. In this state, there are numerous agencies working of various kinds, uh, nonprofit and uh, governmental and other, other kinds, quasi-governmental. And these agencies are working hard to make Hawaii's education the really best it can be for all, all children. And, um, the agency that our guest leads, and we're going to talk to him about today, is the Hawaii P20 Partnerships for Education. And this organization offers numerous initiatives, many, many programs, and uh, data, deep data collection to ensure uh, that, that we know more and know enough and need to know more uh, about equal education opportunity, making that happen in our state, and to support and coordinate policy making where it can be strengthened to uh, advocate for all students' well being, which of course is a foundation for their achievement and for the, the systems and the schools and at learning uh, venues to perform at the, the, the top quality that they need to for all students to fulfill their potential. So, welcome. Executive Director Stephen Schatz uh, from the Hawaii uh, P P20 Partnerships for um, Education. I I think um, it's it's really good to see you, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on. And I think this is such a good time to be talking about education as as it's returning, hopefully returning <laughs> to quotes normal. <laughs> whatever that's going to be in the future. And you may have some things to say about what that could look like, seriously, that would endure out of this crisis we've been in. But tell us a little bit about your experience and, your, and the history of you with the development of the partnerships. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Hawaii P20 Partnerships for Education have been around for a little over 10 years. And it is a partnership among state agencies and in most particularly the early education system, the K-12 public education system, and the University of Hawaii system. And our role and our goal is to create a smooth educational pipeline and meet workforce needs within Hawaii while empowering students to achieve their goals. And um, we do that through policies programs um, and by analyzing data to make sure that the policies and programs we're implementing are actually making the kind of impact that we want to make. Um, so we've been around for a while um, and we try to stay focused on what students are achieving throughout the educational pipeline and whether or not we as an education ecosystem in Hawaii are, are making the kind of impact that we want to make for our, for our kids and for our community. Oh, that's uh, very good news, and all of that in only 10 years. Um, tell me about um, your the mission and the goals. I, I did go over what I, I, I know from your work in general, but um, what your major the, the mission is to address um, ultimately student achievement, right? But to do all of the things and to learn what all the things are that are going to put them on that track. It right. is, and, and I think, you know, we have this goal of, 55% um, of working age adults having a college degree by the year 2025. And so we backwards map from there the educational outcomes we would need to be able to achieve that goal. And so we're measuring not only things like from an early, um, from early elementary school test scores, but also through high school, how many kids are promoted in ninth grade, how many graduate on time, how many end up matriculating to college, um, whether students, in fact, need remediation in college. And so all of our work, all of our programs 
are about achieving results along the educational pipeline and measuring those results for our students as a whole, but also for um, doing so in a way where we can see whether the programs that we're implementing are having the desired effect on various uh, demographic groups, regional um, communities, and, and whether we're truly making an impact or not. Um, so we're really, one of the things that we do is look a lot at the transition between um, educational institutions. We know that we lose a lot of students during those transition points. Even the transition between preschool and kindergarten is hard. The transition mm -hmm. between middle and high school is really challenging. Um, and then high school to college and college to the workforce. So while the institutions themselves are very hard at work on uh, doing their job, the K-12 system does its job and the UH system does its job, where we often lose kids is at, is at those junctures. Um, if you can imagine sort of pipes that um, hit that elbow, and sometimes the leak is right at that elbow. And so a lot of our work is about those transition moments. Well, in Hawaii, with our tradition of uh, private schools, I would imagine that uh, that that may may have a different look uh, after transition because they do tend to pull quite a number, a high number of children out of the public schools. Isn't that the case? That is the case. I, we have a higher percentage than almost any state of um, students in the K twelve um, system who opt for private schools. Um, but we have a good partnership with the private schools um, as well, the K-12 private schools. And our, our P-20 council includes representation from the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools. Um, Shamanad and HPU are on our P-20 council. So we work with everyone. And um, it's really about providing a clean and efficient educational pipeline for Hawaii, whether you're choosing public or private. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask you um, why you took, did you take on the P to the 20 at the outset or did you get courage along the way to do this? What, what about that history? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Actually, you know, I wasn't originally, I, I wasn't there when P20 was stood up. It was stood up. Um, um, with Dr. Tammy Chun, who's now at the UH Community College System, and she she did a great job envisioning what P20 should look like. Um, actually, there were a ton of P20 initiatives throughout the United States, and most of them have not had the um, influence and staying power as the one here in Hawaii. And I, we think part of that is that it wasn't attached to any particular political figure. Um, on in some states and jurisdictions, it might have been a mayor's initiative or a governor's initiative. And so when the next guy or gal came along, it went by the wayside. And um, President Lazar likes to talk about the fact that we've been through, I think, four university presidents and four uh, superintendents and, and now a few e, um, early learning directors. And we're still going strong, still staying focused on um, student achievement and making sure that we have a, a, a strong educational pipeline. Um, at various times in our existence, we've had more or less emphasis on the early ed versus the high school um, part of the equation, but, but we've always been committed to that entire pipeline. Yeah, that's a, quite a commitment, uh, Stephen. That's a huge goal. Um, I wanted to suggest that it might be due to your notion of partnership and how partnership works um, the best. Can you tell us a little bit about the partnership notion and how you've defined it and how it works for this uh, longevity? Sure. You know, I think the, the P20 Council has been a, a big part of that because so P20 is an, an organization. It's a shop um, with employees who do work on the ground. Um, and roll up their sleeves and help kids to apply for UH and do their FAFSA. And um, we do professional development and kind of on the groundwork. But we also have a P20 council comprised of exec executive leadership throughout the state that kind of guides the work overall. Um, I would say over the past few years, one of the exciting aspects of our partnership 
that's a little bit newer is we're we're more focused on partnerships with um, business and industry and starting to ask the questions of our business partners about what they perceive their needs to be in the workforce. And then working with our school partners to figure out how we can align the educational pipeline with workforce needs, with industry needs. And obviously that's gonna be different on Kauai than it is um, here in Honolulu, but, but that partnership between um, all levels of the educational pipeline and businesses, whether they're small or big businesses within communities has been a bit of a new twist um, because we know we want to have a better Hawaii. And that means not only empowering our students to, to achieve their goals, but also many of them want to achieve those goals right here. They want to live here. And so to the extent that we can make them aware of the great jobs that exist here in this state, then it's a win-win. It's a win for the business, it's a win for the community, um, and it's a win for the individual student. Well, that uh, that is really important. I think everybody would like to have that happen. Um, and uh, that's a tough nut, though. Um, but there are other things that are going to be happening, too, to diversify the economy and get us in a place where everybody can stay and, and be aloha in Hawaii. Well, um, then, then you do this work um, with, with partnership. And um, do different people take leads? I know you've already said you've recruited the, not that you've recruited, probably people were very eager to get into your organization and participate, but how, you, how can you just give us a little bit of how you manage all of that? Um, do, <laughs> do, are you your executive director? So you're really having to take this um, boat out and make sure it goes in the right direction, right? <sighs> yeah, but, but I'd say there's so much excitement in the field right now. Um, both in the K-12 space and in higher ed, um, and more energy than ever to collaborate. So, you know, probably 50% of our job is getting the right people in the room to have a conversation. And, um, you know, this pandemic has actually provided us a, a little bit of an easier opportunity to get in the room because the room's virtual. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in particular for our, our rural remote partners, um, we've actually found more participation in our conferences than we had in prior years. Um, and you know, I get notes from some folks in, um, on the neighbor island saying, I hope you guys never go back to, you know, flying everyone into the convention center. This is so much better to ha have this on Zoom. You know, I didn't have to wake up at 430 in the morning. Um, and so I think we're starting to realize that from a work perspective and an equity perspective, um, technology can be very helpful uh, for getting the work done in an efficient way. Now, we, do, we miss the face-to-face. -face, we miss the talking story over coffee and donuts. But, um, but there's got to be a balance there. And I think we're learning along the way. So um, it is then the Hawaii Education Pipeline. Is that your major organizing principle. So could you talk a little bit about that? I noticed that the website's kind of working around that. Certainly your data collection and display does, yeah? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, we think about the education pipeline. We think about um, having quality programs and then indicators to measure progress along that pipeline. Um, as I mentioned, third grade's a really important moment. Um, and whether or not students are reading and doing math at third grade is a huge predictor of success. Um, ninth grade is also a huge um, moment for our students. Uh, some of our students who are academically prepared end up dropping out even though they're academically prepared. So we need to make sure that our high schools are places of aloha, places where uh, students feel comfortable and don't get lost. And then we do a lot of work um, connecting the programs in high school with the programs that are at the 10 University of Hawaii campus. And, um, and that, that's been a really fun initiative over the past few years to make sure that, for example, early college is offered in most of the 45 um, traditional public high schools. Um, but but it, it, most importantly, that students can see their pathway from high school through college and into a career. So, 
our organizing principle actually from, from at least middle school is that there should be a pathway. There should be a pathway that takes you to your career. And now how does the data collection that you do inform that pathway? How, do you, how does that uh, um, uh, uh, operate um, to be a, a partnership of the data and what happens in your program? rather than just an yeah. assessment thing, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think for, for us, the data, no one data point is gonna tell a story, um, but it helps to tell a story, right? If you get a whole bunch of different pixels on a screen, the, the, the image becomes a little bit more vivid. And um, so we feel one of our roles is to measure progress and hold ourselves accountable as an education community for whether or not we're seeing progress. So that's sort of from the macro perspective. We, we need to, as an education community, measure our progress, see whether kids are graduating, see whether they're going to college, whether they need remediation. And then the other is some of our data is helpful for regional teams. So on a, on a more micro level, there are resources available, for example, at hawaiidx, hawaiidxp.org, where schools and um, actually K-12 schools and institutes of higher education can look at data to see what are the results of the educational pipeline in their region. And then there's some labor market data. We have a data sharing agreement with the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations that enables us to see, for example, what the median wages are as they relate to University of Hawaii programs or the percentage of students who graduate from particular programs who end up in Hawaii's workforce. So those kinds of more micro level data sources can help with planning and help with creating pathways, um, pathways that make sense. Um, because I, I think we, all, we often ask kids what they wanna be when they grow up, but, but we should also ask them where they wanna live. Um, because if they wanna live here, then the answer to, then, then it's a little bit of a different set of questions um, and courses that might be available to them. Um, so Pathways is the organizing principle for both the programmatic work and, and the data itself. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the analogy that I've used over, over the past few years is if you can imagine like a, a six mile hike and the first two miles is owned by the state, and then the second two miles is owned by the city. And then the third two miles is owned by a private owner. And they're all beautifully maintained. But in between, I think when you get to the end of the first two, there's a whole bunch of brush and shrub. And you actually, you got it. It's really, really hard to get from segment A to segment B. And so that's what we need to do a little bit of a better job of is not only creating good segments of the trail, but also making sure they're connected and that you as a, as the person on the pathway, as a hiker, so to speak, can actually see the vision and know how to get through. Well, I think that's an interesting metaphor. Absolutely. Because I know that um, I've had, I've looked up some data on school performance um, through this new Stanford data collection. And they were very interesting because they actually have data by school. So they they can they talk about the numbers um, at the level, and of course you, the P twelve partnership was wrote so compelling too because you've got the data, not only like that but also by um, ethnicity or an ethnic subgroup, and um, you don't much get to see anything on on Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders or, or Filipino students. You know, I so that was really actually thrilling because I, I, I know not even the U.S. Department of Education doesn't take it there either. So it's really hard to get that data. So that's that is really interesting. And but what I what I'm seeing when I happen to look up the that that's really not the North Shore, but it's there Haula and um, Laie and that area because I know uh, someone who might be living up there. And um, I saw that there was quite a bit of, um, of non, of, uh, well, under and underachievement, you know, in some of those schools at, up on that part of the coast. So I uh, wanted to know, and I actually had years ago some work to do out there and it, and it was um, 
challenging too. So I, when we have places like that, like we've had Leeward Coast uh, focuses, uh, you know, with many programs at not Acapone and Wanina, but now what about over there too, where they're 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 underachieving? Are you saying that part of that going in between those different areas of the six mile hike, it's that that's tough to get that real specific focus in there? Is that how do, how do you work to address what Hawaii needs to address, which is to pump up um, this achievement gap, uh, get these unders on top of or even with, you know, their achievement potential? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our work is focused on. Um, helping under, historically underrepresented students and student groups to matriculate to college. So a big source of funding and a big grant we have is Gear Up, which is a federal grant um, where we work in middle and high middle and high schools with their community college partners, um, again, to establish pathways. Um, and I think the, the first thing we need to do is have high expectations for our students. And then the second thing we need to do is create actual structure for them to succeed. And I think we've seen it happen. We've seen it done. We've seen the great work that's done at um, places like Waipahu High School, Waimea High School, um, Campbell High School. We're starting to see success throughout the state. Um, so we know it can be done, and we just need to continue to build the structure to make it happen. And, and, um, and, and it's happening. It's happening for sure. Well, I, I know the Gear Up program, and uh, I, I, it's highly uh, lauded and um, a very valuable program, and um, and pretty um, steady um, uh, funding. If if um, you follow the directions, which is the secret to federal funding, is <laughs> follow the directions <laughs> when you put the application in. But and I have the need, and I and it certainly is there. So I mean, it's really good to see a program like that out there, just pumping away with what it can do. But are you? Um, and so you have this multifaceted approach. So yes, and and they're high and having high expectations and bringing that self confidence up so that they understand that they can go where they want to go uh, if they choose to, um, and then get that academic achievement piece in there too. I mean, that's a lot of stuff. That's what you're weaving into. The yeah, I mean, I think there's. Um... I think you're right. There, there are structural components that need to be there, like the counseling, like the rigorous coursework, even work-based learning and early college. Those are key components. But academic rigor is a piece of the puzzle, too. So we need to make sure that students are, um, are academically prepared, um, because what we don't want to do is um, help students get into college who eventually then struggle once they get there, right? So we want to make sure that kids yeah. are academically prepared to meet the rigors of college. And that's one of the reasons early college is so exciting is kids can actually get a taste of it, um, get some self-confidence, have some success, and then they start to believe that they can, um, they can go to college and they can succeed there because they've actually already, you know, many of our students are now graduating from high school with um, maybe six credits or two courses worth under yeah. their belt before they even before they even graduate such a, such a terrific leg up i mean that that's very very helpful be a little bit on the on the path as you say well um i can't recall if gear up requires this but you know usually in federal funding which i'm sure you your funding is probably all across the board right i mean i know you have just long list of castle foundation funding and of course the cares act that, and uh the stoopsie foundation and um and also uh the UH Foundation and also Hawaii Community Foundation and so and also what what are the and then those uh, those grants that you're they're working you're working on and I'm sure there are many of them that are um, federal and by the way I saw that the National Science Foundation is just getting a huge hunk of money to to them which means they're going to be putting out some you know programs in math and science which might which are probably of great interest but in most of those federal grants and especially those from the Department of Education, they usually ask, there's usually a section or some points that you can get if you can portray <laughs> the future of the work and that it won't just vaporize once yeah. you get down to your last $10. So how, how do you all think about stabilizing and continuing the work 
when you have, because you can have gaps in the funding and that sort of thing. So what, what are the sorts of things you think about that? Yeah, I mean, this is where I think we're really lucky here to have such great partners on the ground. Um, partners like the Castle Foundation, um, the Hawaii Community Foundation, uh, the Stupski Foundation. We have a real commitment to, to making education work throughout the state. So it's, not, you know, I see what you're saying about you have to write in the sustainability portion of your grant, but it's true here. We're really all committed to making this stuff work. Um, we are, uh, you know, a lot of our work starts with a pilot program and, and then we try and measure the success of that pilot and see if it can scale. Uh, early college is a perfect example. It started out with gear up funds and some philanthropic dollars from the McInerney and Castle Foundations and, and the legislature eventually supported it. Um, and, and that's a perfect example of one where um, it was successful throughout the state on various islands and, and the legislature and the governor um, wanted to be supportive of the program, but it started with a little seed of an idea. And um, so, you know, we're, we're hopeful about some of our other ideas maybe scaling as well. Well, you know, I think uh, we can see the website from here. Is there anything in particular you'd like to share from that? I mean, I don't know. I, I've looked at, the, if you might want to talk us through a little bit of it that um, are your favorite parts. Well, I, the, what's my favorite right now is this Next Steps to Your Future program. Um, this was a program that we stood up last spring and summer for the class of 2020 as a result of the pandemic. And so this was a program where students were able to take free community college classes during the summer, and they were connected with advisors uh, who could help them via tech with things like filling out their college application or completing their FAFs or even polishing up their resume if they wanted to go straight into the workforce. So this program really, um, we had some success last summer and it was stood up really quick on the back of a napkin with some philanthropic support. Um, and we're doing another version of it this summer. So the class of 2021, um, if anybody's listening, go to nextsteps.hawaii.edu. You can sign up for free community college classes or free advising via tech or both. And um, if you're part of the Next Steps cohort, you're going to be eligible for certain scholarships to go to college. So Next Steps is a great program that we wouldn't have been able to do without our wonderful philanthropic partners here in the state. Well, I just think people get frightened and confused about where do you start? What, what am I supposed to do? Drive up to Benoa? I mean, what, you know? So that kind of specific uh, information is really important. I'm glad, I'm glad you said it on this show so people know it's there. And that class has been pretty challenged. So they do deserve some uh, assist there. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your Connecting for Success program. That, that seems really interesting. And that, um, that does show the data trend, brings the data in to strengthen their um, opportunities to benefit from school. Yeah, I mean, this was a, um, a program that we implemented for uh, middle school students by um, helping them with their social emotional um, issues. And, you know, one of the things I think is important to note in education is sometimes people pose things as opposites when they're not. Like you're either a social emotional learning person or you're an academic rigor person. And, and the truth is, to the extent that your social emotional issues are balanced and under control, that's probably going to have a positive effect on academics and vice versa. And so we, we implemented that program and we found that those social emotional interventions actually had a positive effect, not only on behavioral outcomes, but also academic outcomes. And um, yeah, I think it's one of the problems with education today is people create opposites where, that are not true opposites. They they put they put innovation over here and rigor over here, but and those aren't opposites. They put empowerment over here and accountability over here, and those aren't opposites. So to me, I think we we have to have more of a yes and mentality about the way we do our work. Oh yes, and I think you did that on the website about that program and uh, that piece of the pipeline. What was it? The miracle of first child change. Can you save anybody at uh, mid school? 
right? It was uh, nicely done with that kind of idea in mind. Yeah, answers, yeah. Yes, there are lots yeah, of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then, you know, my experience, I was an area superintendent um, for the DOE for a while, and, and um, I would see, as I mentioned, students would fill out a 4140, which is an exception to compulsory education, which essentially is the form through which you either become homeschooled or maybe you go to work, but essentially you're not going to finish high school. Ah, and yeah. sometimes they would attach their test scores. And the eighth grade test scores were exceeds proficiency. So we have to remember that the academics are important, but it's not the only thing that helps students to become successful. And some of our academically ready kids are struggling. And some of our um, and some of our kids need more academic readiness. So again, yes, and as we do all this work together. Oh, that's a really good point. I know I was at Georgetown University for some reason wandering around. And here came this whole pack of kids with red t-shirts on all saying gear up. And as I said, I'd, I'd known about that program. And I just thought, my goodness, this is fabulous for these kids to be wa wandering around or getting a tour of Georgetown to see what it is that they they can they can strive for. So getting getting them out and doing those kinds of things is, is just really important. And I know they they try to get them into the advanced uh, credit courses too. So there's lots to do. Well, um, I just think that your partnership notion is working for you. And with the heavy hitters that you have, you have really some top great people on that on that uh, the the on the on the board, you call it the board, whatever. The council. Yeah. council. yeah. Does that help with policy making about what Hawaii's education needs to do? Is that another layer of, of that? Yeah, I mean, it's not a formal policy making bo body, but it, it certainly helps to set direction for the state. Yeah. So have you felt like you've gotten some actual traction on some movement? Um, you know, I think people feel so out of touch with the, and, uh, that the schools are untouchable. You know, we're so centralized here. Yeah. yeah although, the, although the centralization is, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but it's certainly um, one of the reasons we're able to collaborate a little, little more seamlessly, having one school district and one public higher ed. Um, I would say with regards to the P20 Council in particular, you know, that direction setting was really important in establishing the 55 by 25 goal, which has helped to lead um, UHs and um, the DOE's work over the last uh, seven to 10 years. Well, I, I mean, you're also, in addition to this, for the spectrum of E20, the, all of the islands. So we uh, haven't mentioned specifically about the outer islands, but they're, they're um, needing um, gear up kind of program. All these these approaches that you have are really important to having them uh, be in touch with their their world and their possibilities here. And they don't have to go uh, to other places. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have to really think as a community about what we're going to do to um, solve for the ruralness and the remoteness of the educational experience that students have. That's certainly a strength for them but it also means a little bit more difficulty with access. And so I think technology can be a solution there. Um, so we're working on standing up um, some early college courses where we aggregate a few kids from a few different schools, maybe a five kids from Hana and five kids from Kau and five kids from Lanai and, you know, and, and they can take an early college class with Honolulu CC or UH Manoa. So, you know, th this is the future, I think, where we we kind of cut down those borders and, and, and make it more efficient for, for our kids. Okay. Well, um, are you, um, is there anyone in particular that um, deals with the data that anybody that's a researcher person or policymaker might be interested in getting um, to know a little bit more about, about your database and how it's informative for their work? Sure. So so Jean Osumi is our lead for the whole AP20 data, data team. And we at P20 are the managing partner of the data exchange partnership. And that data exchange partnership is the um, multi-agency partnership between DOE, um, University of Hawaii, DLIR, DOH, and DHS. 
And so we have some data sharing agreements among us that enable us to kind of take a look at whether or not we're making the kind of impact we want to make throughout the educational pipeline. You know, there is, uh, we're close to ending here, but there's a question and the viewer um, is saying, um, does your plan include children with learning disabilities or does it focus on neurotypical kids? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly all of our work focuses on um, ensuring that students who have typically been underrepresented in higher ed achieve. And so, and, and our data is always, um, it's always able to be disaggregated um, by um, ethnic group and by learning disability. And so we, we want people to have the utility of that disaggregation so they can help to uh, make the kinds of plans that they want to make for the pathways that make sense for the kids that they have. Really important, really important. So uh, thanks for bringing that up um, uh, about the disaggregation uh, and which is more motivation or incentive for people to take a look at the website, look at the pipeline and see where all of this data plays out, see what trends they can find. But we've been, we we need to get to aloha time and uh, just say how uh, wonderful it's been talking with you uh, remotely and uh, you are the executive director of uh, the Hawaii P20 Partnerships for Education and this is Mr. Stephen Schatz. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from him um, as we go forward, especially as things change and schools do many more things. But thank you for, for listening. Aloha, mahalo, and I'll see you again in two weeks on the state of the state of Hawaii. Thanks for your attention, everybody. <laughs>